I don't know if you've ever been walking down the street or maybe in a forest in a park and you notice some random plant growing out of a tree. It's not the same plant as the tree, but these random plants grow out of other plants. If you've seen that, maybe you wondered, is that hurting the plant? Is it a symbiotic relationship? In this video, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about all the different relationships within a community, including the one you see here. Let's get started. So a few years ago, I was very fortunate to get to go to the Great Barrier Reef and I invested in one of those GoPro cameras underwater thing. And in 2016, when I was getting to snorkel the Great Barrier Reef, I took this picture. And I'm starting with this because it's such an interesting idea to think that in our water, there are these fascinating communities of life. This one happens to be a lot of coral, but of course, surrounding this coral were fish and sea anemones, lots of different populations within the community. In this video, I want to talk about what makes up a community. And we talk about communities in terms of their composition and diversity. This particular community here that I saw in the Great Barrier Reef was composed of a lot of coral, some fish. What about diversity? Well, I would have had to actually look at different species to be able to count the diversity. Here, you might see in water, we would see a lot of plankton diversity. Look at these, look at these crazy creatures, right? So there's an incredible amount of diversity in the plankton community in many of these marine ecosystems. So in this video, we're gonna look at the composition and diversity within these communities. And this really all falls under the big category, the big umbrella of community ecology, which is basically just the study of all the populations in an environment and how they interact. So how does the coral interact with the fish, interact with the sea anemones, interact with the, at this time, people, humans, that were snorkeling around the Great Barrier Reef at that time. So we want to start by defining a few terms. A niche, sometimes depending on where you are in the country, you might hear the word niche, but a niche is really just an organism's role. Now don't confuse niche with habitat, okay? The habitat of an organism is its address, where it lives. Its niche is its job or its role within that ecosystem. And so, one of the most interesting organism niches that I've ever seen is the flightless dung beetle. Um, it's a beetle, and as its name suggests, it actually collects and rolls the dung, a lot from elephants, um, and then it uses that for its nutrients, right? So it eats the feces of some of these other animals. That's a very particular niche, right? Its role, its job in the community is to eat this dung um, or feces from other animals. Uh, another interesting niche that I find uh, that a lot of people don't think about is actually mistletoe, right? We, when it's the holiday season, everybody likes to stand under the mistletoe. We like to talk about the mistletoe. But actually, mistletoe is a hemiparasitic plant. Its niche, its job, it is sort of a parasite. And it gets nutrients from a lot of these trees. So while we like to think about it and sing songs about mistletoe, it's actually um, a hemiparasitic plant. So these two organisms, the mistletoe and the dung beetle, they have jobs or roles in their community. Those are called niches. So when we talk about niches, there's a few different principles we wanna consider. One of them is called the competitive exclusion principle. So if you look in this uh, first part of the diagram, you can see that we've got some yellow birds. Their niche is really to eat the bugs on this tree, right? Now, what happens is we find, let's say that the red birds in this example outcompete the yellow birds. They're better at getting 
the bugs. They're stronger. They can scare off maybe the yellow birds. So they're able, the red birds are able to outcompete the yellow. So you can see here the red birds, if they are living in the same area, they're going to outcompete and get the insects. So we call this the competitive exclusion principle. Because there's competition, right, the red versus the yellow, one of them might be excluded from this particular niche getting these bugs. In this case, it's the yellow ones that are excluded because of this competition. So what we see, right, is that the yellow have this entire possible niche. They, this is their possibility or fundamentally what they could do. However, because the red outcompetes, it's going to force the yellow in two different niches. Well, maybe the yellow are going to have to come up here in the canopy of the tree and, and, and utilize this niche, or maybe they'll have to be on the ground utilizing the niche down here. We would call that a realized. In other words, in reality, because the red are out competing here for these insects on the tree trunk, the niche for these other organisms might have to move. So we call this the competitive exclusion principle. And it says that when there's competition, um, one species might be excluded and have to find a different niche to survive. One way of getting around some of these competitions is something called resource partitioning. And so I've got a background here of a rainforest, maybe it's a jungle. And why I've got this background is to show you that there's a way that organisms can reduce the competition through something we call microhabitats. This is resource partitioning. They partition the resources so that many different species can actually survive in the same place. Take, for example, the anole lizards. We see a lot of these in the Dominican Republic, parts of the Caribbean. Um, and we found that in some sites, there are up to 15 different species of animal lizards that can actually survive in this area or at this site because of the way they partition the resources. So, for example, some lizards might be up on little twigs and they're getting all the insects and the bugs or something um, from that area up there. Some of the lizards partition and they find themselves with these big leaves, right? in all the greenery, the shrubbery in that particular area. Some might find themselves on the rocks, eating other resources in the rocks. Others might be on the tree trunks themselves or things that have fallen. Others might find that they're getting uh, their resources from the flowers or the different fruits that are available. So the main point, the main idea of this is that if several species live in one site, they might be able to resource partition or partition the resources and be in different habitats, thus reducing the overall competition. If all of these organisms, if all of these lizards were going for the same area, the same particular microhabitat, they wouldn't all survive because there's so much competition. But if they can partition those resources, then there's an ability because of the differentiation of the niches for many to survive in one area. So what are some other interactions that we might see in terms of symbiosis? So if you think of symbio, right? Life together, symbiotic interaction. Some are positive, some are negative. So let's go over the main symbiotic interactions that we think of. The first one is competition. And you can see that I've got two negatives, meaning that both species or both members of the species are negatively impacted by competition. Competition's not good um, in terms of a symbiotic interaction because there's limited resources. So both, in a way, are in the negative or hurting. And so here's some prime examples. Um, the lion and the spotted hyena, they are in competition for the same food. So this interaction, competition, is negative for both. They don't have as many resources as they like. Flamingos, and here you can see the flamingos competing for food or other mates, for example. Competition is when no one benefits. The other example is predation or parasitism. This is when one benefits, one gets a positive, 
But the other, of course, the prey, is a, has a negative consequence. And so you can see here some parasitic fungus growing on the leaf. So this fungus is having a positive experience because it's getting nutrients from the leaf, but you can see it's killing the leaves as well. So that's negative. You also see here, oh, this one's kind of scary if you didn't know what these looked like. These are human head lice, and you can see the hairs. So this is a parasite, right? It's benefiting, and the, the host, humans, um, has a negative consequence. Uh, this one here is really weird for me, too. These are tongue-eating louse, right? It's a tongue-eating louse or tongue-eating lice inside this particular fish. And so these lice latch on, eat the tongue, so to speak. Um, and that is also a parasite. So in predation parasitism, one benefits, one is harmed. Mutualism, beneficial for everyone. It's mutualistically beneficial. So some prime examples, you've probably seen the clownfish and the sea anemone. They both benefit, right? The, the clownfish has a place to hide. The sea anemone gets some of the leftover resources from the fish. Here, if you sort of zoom in, you see a bird, the oxpecker, and it's sitting on an impala. Well, how is this a mutualistic relationship? One, this oxpecker is eating the ticks off the impala. So it benefits the bird, it's getting some food, benefits the impala because it's getting its ticks eaten off of it. Uh, the last example for mutualism here is this hummingbird on some dianthus, okay? So the hummingbird's getting its food, its resources, its nectar, and then it's helping to pollinate the flower. The last uh, category of interactions is commensalism. This is when one benefits and the other is sort of neutral. Right, it's as we, I say a zero because it's neither harmed or benefits. Um, and this is the example that we started the whole video with, is some random plant growing out of a tree. So this is an example of an epiphyte. And what you see here is when one species, in this, can, in this case this epiphyte, is growing out of another. And what we see here is that the epiphyte benefits, right? It's, it has a place to grow but it's actually not hurting the tree. So one benefits, but the other is not hurt. The other really prime example we see a lot are these little barnacles attached to whales. You can see all these barnacles. They benefit because they get some resources, they get to move through the water, but they don't seem to hurt the whale. So one benefits, the other is not harmed, but it doesn't benefit, that's called commensalism. So we've talked a lot about some of these relationships. Particularly, let's zoom in to this predator-prey relationship because this drives evolution. So evolution, natural selection, chooses traits that are good for predation, whether you're the predator or the prey. So let's think about some traits that would be good for predators. So these would be called predator adaptations. These are things that would help us or predators locate prey or subdue their prey. So most of these are anatomical, if you think about it, right? The albatross, its anatomical ability with its eyesight to see, locate, swoop in, kill its prey. That is an adaptation driven by evolution. Uh, you see this bear skull here with these huge teeth able to tear things apart. That's another predatory evolutionary adaptation that allows it to be an apex predator. Um, you can see here this red-tailed hawk. It's got lots of adaptations. Its ability to fly, but also its talons and its um, claws that can tear apart things. That is a predatory adaptation. And then a funny one here, if you think about a chameleon with that really long tongue, that's also an adaptation to be able to reach out and get its prey. So these are all adaptations of predators. Um, what about some adaptations if you're prey? Well, what do you want to do if you are the one being hunted? Well, if I was being hunted, I would try to run, right? Elude, get away, don't let them see me. Or if I had to, defend. So one way to elude or defend 
that Prey have adapted over the time is aposematic coloration. These really bright colors tend to warn off predators, and you can see that coloration here in this octopus. If you are a predator of an octopus and you see this bright coloration, you may be like, yeah, that color has not done well for me in the past. I would probably want to avoid that. Same thing here with a venomous coral snake. Uh, this bright coloration is a warning to predators. Warning, stay away with these toads as well, these frogs. Um, that bright war color is a warning. We call that aposematic coloration. So that's one way prey have adapted to warn. Another really interesting one is one we call mimicry. So if you are um, out and you see one of these flying things flying at you, you are probably going to run, swat, move away, let the wasps, the stinging insects, have their space. But believe it or not, these down here, these don't actually, excuse me, this one, this one doesn't actually sting. Some of these flies and some of these beetles mimic stinging insects. We call this mimicry. By mimicking one of the stinging insects, the other predators stay away, right? I don't care what it, what it is, a beetle, a fly, a stinging insect. If I see this coloration, this yellow and this black, I'm getting away from it. I'm going to let it have its time. So mimicry is a prey adaptation. And then some other ones you might not think about are um, toxins, thorns, spines. Think about a rose bush and all the thorns. You don't want to get in there, right? So this is a way that prey adapt. In this case, the prey would be the rose bush. They adapt to keep other things, predators, out. And actually, if you think about it, even though some weird humans really like to eat these really hot peppers, I don't get it, um, this actually was an adaptation from the pepper plant to keep some predators away, keep them from eating the plant. Okay, so we've got predator adaptations, prey adaptations. And you can see I kind of did like a weird box Venn diagram thing here because I think there are some traits that actually could benefit the predator and the prey. So camouflage is one of those. I think falls sort of in both categories. If you're a predator, you can sneak up on something like this Katie did right blends in you can barely see it or if you're prey maybe this lizard you can barely see them because of the camouflage um, and on the predator side this leopard here that is really blending in right you could easily walk up on that and not even see it there so camouflage i think could be both predator and a prey adaptation and then of course the other one is speed speed for a predator helps speed for prey helps. So all of these characteristics are selected by nature to survive because of predation. And these interactions in the community affect how these particular organisms are part of their ecolog ecological role within that community. So in terms of speaking of evolution, what you need to think about is that these species actually evolve these things simultaneously, many of them. We call it co-evolution, right? Evolution together within a community. And these predator-prey relationships like we just talked about are a prime example. So talk about a bat. They evolved over time the ability to see moths or insects or their prey in the dark using this echolocation. But at the same time, the moths, for example, they're evolving the ability to hear better, to interpret that echolocation, and then fly away, right? So the predator-prey relationships mean that both the predator and the prey are evolving or co-evolving in the community at the same time. Another really interesting one that we're really seeing a lot right now, it's 2021, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, um, and it's this parasite host relationship. How, for example, the HIV virus 
has evolved over time with its host. So you can see, so HIV evolution, you can see how it sort of started here with some sort of ancestor, um, human, virus one, there's actually a few strains of HIV, one and two, um, and then the simian one, the virus that we see in other primates. Uh, and HIV has continued to evolve over time, but as the parasite has evolved, guess what? So has the host. There are actually humans being born today that are immune to HIV. They have a particular gene which makes them immune. So the parasite and the host are both evolving at the same time. And then another example, of course, is flowers and pollinators co-evolving. In this case, you see a pollinating wasp that's being drawn to this particular flower. So the flower is evolving these abilities to attract these pollinators. The pollinators are evolving the ability to get to and get the nutrients uh, from this particular flower. So finally, we wanna talk about how these different populations interact together. And there are a few ways that we talk about these interacting relationships and model them mathematically. So the first one that we model mathematically is the predator-prey relationship, of course. And here we see our hare, right? The white-tailed hare. Here we see the lynx, predator, prey. Now, we can actually model the relationship. And there's actually been a ton of studies on these. Um, Lepus americanus, right, the hare. And then the lynx we see there. Now, what do you notice? Okay. And this has been traced, and you can see the years here. When the lynx population goes up really high, that immediately sends, of course, that means that the hair population is low. But when a hair, pop get, hair population gets low, the lynx doesn't have anything to eat, so that number, those numbers come crashing down. Well, guess what? When there are no more predators, now the hares, their population can go up. Well, as the hair population goes up slightly behind it, you see the predator population go up. When it peaks, then there are no more hairs, and the cycle continues, right? So you see this sort of cyclical nature of the predator-prey relationship because um, if one really spikes, then the other, there's more food to eat, so the lynx population is going to spike. Eventually, when it gets too high, all the lynx are dead, the population of both plummet. In terms of viruses, parasites, we actually can model epidemiological to see how epidemics and viruses spread. This is the 2014 West Africa Ebola epidemic, and you can see how we could model in different areas what's happening. We had some big spikes. In our current pandemic, we see, right, we talk about the first wave, the second wave, et cetera. Um, and so epidemics can actually be monitored and modeled mathematically as well. And there's a whole field of epidemiology which does that. And then we could even model how invasive species like kudzu take over areas, right? Most of them would be sort of a, if you've got a graph, they would be a very much exponential growth pattern because these invasive species outperform all the other native or local species in the area. And so we could ma map and do mathematical models on how these invasive species are surviving in certain areas. So hopefully all of these things together if you think about the symbiotic relationships and you think about this mathematical modeling will help you come up with a picture about how communities survive and how communities thrive. And it really has to do with the populations within the community and how they interact. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, like and subscribe.